Thank you, Laura. Uh, so let's um, uh, continue where we left, uh, where we stopped last time. So, so let me just take a very quick recap. So last time I gave you a quick intro to connectivity augmentation problems, to um, uh, in particular to tree augmentation. And now we want to slowly move towards getting a better than two approximation factor for the unweighted version of the tree augmentation problem, which is simply called TAP. Um, I promise I'm going to be explicit and call it unweighted TAP, but, but if I talk about TAP, that's, I mean, the unweighted version. And later on, then we want to move to the, the weighted version of tree augmentation. But before we go to the, um, uh, before we want to obtain, uh, uh, or we, before we're ready to obtain actually a better than two approximation for TAP, um, we um, uh, discussed, we start discussing already a couple of special cases that of TAP and also of weighted TAP, of, of W TAP, that we can solve efficiently. And there's one more I would like to cover before we, um, uh, uh, which also we, we need later on, before we move on to the better than two approximation for TAP. And that's weighted TAP with logarithmically many leaves. It's, it's one way to phrase it. And um, Oh, maybe one thing I would like to add. So, so thanks again for the comments last time. I, I, I did add already last time's example of the, the integrality gap example of um, uh, for the cut LP of one but five. I did just add uh, two sentences uh, indicating the, the corresponding reference. And it's, I mean, it's a very nice example. I, if you're interested in, in LP based procedures, uh, I very much recommend to, to think about that example a little bit. Okay, back to that logarithmically many leaves case. So what I'm actually gonna, gonna show is a, this, the following theorem here, which is by Marx and Weig, and also has been used by, by Newtoff uh, in the context of tree augmentation. And one way to phrase it is that it turns out that tree augmentation is fixed parameter tractable as FPT um, in the number of leaves. So more, more precisely, we can solve it in a running time of four to the K, where K is the number of leaves of your instance of your, of your input tree times a polynomial uh, uh, in the input size. And I think it's a nice, nice result, it's good to know. And um, let me, uh, so what it uses is, is the following. It uses the, the metric completion of uh, W tab instance. So this, is, this works for weighted tabs. So here, you're back to weighted tab, even though it will switch later on to the unweighted version. So what is the metric completion? It's um, probably what you, what you think it, it should be, but let me be explicit about it. So you're given a tab instance, or, or to be precise, a W tab instance. And now for any pair of vertices in that instance, let's look at the pair U and V. I would like to add a new link, if it doesn't exist already, uh, between U and V. So I have to make sure I don't change the instance by doing that. So what we're going to do is we will add a link that has a cost or, or a weight to be precise that is equal to the cheapest link set that covers the path between U and V. So let me uh, clear. So that's this path between U and V. Let me just draw it in gray. So this would be P U V. So I will just, I will first compute for each pair U and V a cheapest link set covering just that path. So that way I'm sure if I, and the later give L the, the weight of that, of that link set. That way I'm sure if you use L later on, I can just replace it by the cheapest link set and I don't pay more than what I have to pay for the link L. So why is that possible to compute? The reason is that, so if to be able to compute it efficiently, of course, that metric, comple uh, metric completion or just, just completion. Um, let me give you a quick example of uh, how things may look like. So maybe that's part of your, your instance. I will not draw everything or more, more stuff hanging uh, at U or V. And you may be given links, let's say the, the links that you're given originally are, uh, are these links here, there's an L1, maybe an L2 over here, L3, L4, L5, and let's do one more here, L6. So this may be the original instance you, you had, so maybe the links that interact with that part. Maybe let me be a bit more general, maybe this L1, of course, it could also start somewhere outside and go to that vertex. So what I draw here are all the links of your original instance whose path covers at least something of the gray area. So they can, that it makes sense to use them to cover the gray path. Now you want to find the cheapest links of covering the gray path. So what you can do is, it's just an interval covering problem, actually. You could just replace those links by 
just the part that they cover. So L1 covers these, the single edge here, the single gray edge here. So you can think of it as, as L1 prime for the, the problem of covering the gray path. It's the same whether you use L1 prime or L1. So L2 could be replaced by this L2 prime. L3 covers this part of the tree. So it can just as well be replaced by L3 prime and so on. So L5 is already an uplink. It's a link that goes between two endpoints of the path. So this one I just keep. The, oh, I have two twice L5. Not that good at counting. Let me replace that with an L6. And so L6 is the same. I can just keep it. And L4 can be replaced by that link here. So covering the path between U and B by blue links is the same as covering it by the orange ones, because the orange ones just capture the part that you cover of the gray path. But now the orange ones, they're all uplinks. For example, we choose U as being the root. And there are uplinks, so if an uplink only instance, and it can be solved efficiently because the corresponding constraint matrix is TU. That's what we saw last time. So more precise, it's just an interval covering problem I obtained here. So long story short, um, the metric completion can be computed efficiently. And that's one way to do it. Perfect. As usual, as, as Laura already said, if you have questions, I mean, do not hesitate to just drop them in the chat. I will always check the, the chat regularly and I'm more than happy to answer questions uh, on the way. Good, so why, so why do we talk about the metric completion? What does it have to do with, with solving W tab in, in, uh, in FPT time, the number of leaves? The reason is that I wanna reduce the instance. Imagine if I had an instance without degree two very seeds, that's where I wanna go. And then, uh, then it turns out that the, the size of a tree, if you have no degree to a vertex, the size of a tree is at most twice the number of leaves. But this means that suddenly the whole instance is, has a size is in the order of number of leaves. And suddenly I can be exponential in the size of the instance. That's where you wanna go. And that's why I wanna show this result next, the result saying that indeed, if you give me any way to have instance, um, any complete ones so apply this completion strategy, then there always exists an optimal solution that has no link, uses no link with an end with such that an endpoint of the link is a degree two vertex. Let's uh, let's check that. So how could that look like? You may have, let's assume, let's let's do a proof by um, um that's not really a proof by contradiction. Let's just assume I give you an opt solution, an, an optimal solution, and assume it has a link that ends at a degree two vertex. So let me just you know this vertex here. So degree two vertex, let's say it's U or, or B. So it has degree two. And when I draw triangles, I always mean such as general subtrees. So it could be an arbitrary subtree hanging at that, at that place. And so assume you have an opt solution where there's some link with an endpoint at this degree two vertex. So let's call it L1. And now I claim there are two things that can happen in such an optimal solution. I mean, someone has to cover, some other link has to cover the edge E, the edge right below, I mean, on the other side of V, the one that's not covered by L1. It's a bit, a bit um, uh, maybe imprecise to talk about below or above, you don't have a root right here. And there are two cases, and because I will have the second case later, let me just copy this picture now, or forget about it. So let's look at the first case. So in the first case, could be that this edge E is is covered by another link that starts at V. And of course it has to go somewhere into that subtree here. I mean, potentially to that vertex that, I, that you see here, that the other end point of E, but more generally it could be any vertex in that subtree. So let's call this L2. That's one case. So what's the other case? Maybe we can first just show what the cases are and then we can go into, into those cases a bit more in detail. And the other one, it could be that this edge here also has to be covered by a link L2, but maybe that link L2 will, has, will have the other end point Somewhere, not at V, but somewhere here in that subtree. So you're forcibly in one of these two cases. So, but in both of those, so I assume that, that those two links are L1 and L2 are part of opt. So you have an optimal solution where a link has an endpoint that is degree two, but here you could just combine the two links into a single one. You could just use them, um, just replace them by that link here. That link exists because we used to have a metric completion. Moreover, it covers the same subpath on the tree as is covered by L1 and L2 together, right? 
because they the L1 covers some subpath, some path from here to here, and L2 from that vertex further down. But that's precisely the path that's covered if you go from one endpoint of L to the other one. So replacing L1 and L2 by L indeed leads to another solution. Moreover, that link is no more expensive than the sum of these two costs because of the metric completion. I mean, L1 and L2 do, as we just discussed, if they do cover the path between the endpoints of L, so this is one, it's one option to, um, uh, to cover that path, so L will be no more expensive than these two links. Let me just write maybe a quick sentence about it. So in this case, you can simply combine, um, let me switch back to black, you can combine L1 and L2 um, into single link. Yeah. So combining it just it really just means to replace. So it combines a bit less precise. Just remove L1, L2, add L. You will have another solution without that. So, so in other words, if I if I assume that we start with an optimal solution with the smallest number of links, that case just never happens. Right? So what about the other case? In the other case here. And we have the following situation. What you can do is you can replace the first link L1 by a link going from here to that endpoint. Let me call this link L again. So again, what is the what you can do is you can just shorten L1 to the link L. So let's again just check the things that first we again obtain a solution. We obtain a solution because the only difference between what L covers and what L1 covers is L1 covers that edge here, which is not covered by L, but that one is covered by L2. So you still cover all of the edges. Therefore, there will still be a solution when you do the replacement step. Moreover, again, by the metric completion, this link does exist. I mean, every link, every between any two endpoints, between any two vertices, there's a link. And its cost is no more than the one of L1 because L1 does cover um, the, the path between the endpoints of L. So again, here we have PL is contained in PL1. We also call L a shadow of L1. I will get back to the shadow concept in a short moment. But this implies that the cost of, because of completion, the cost or weight of L is no more than the weight of L1. And this is the case too. Good. So here, in this case, you can shorten the link. So if you look at an optimal solution with the smallest number of links possible, and among those with such that no link can be shortened into can be shortened into shorter one, then you will actually never have any of these two cases, which implies that there will be no link in your optimal solution that has an endpoint of degree two. And this is shows the length. So let's go back to the proof of that statement. Let's just let's just Restated here, just so we have it on the um, on this uh, on the slide on this page here. So why is that useful? So now, because of the previous lemma, it means that you can actually just focus on solutions that uh, only use links between vertices that are not of degree two. But this means whenever you have a degree two vertex, you can just remove it. Essentially, you can just uh, delete the vertex and connect its neighbors uh, right away by a by a direct edge. Therefore. What you, what you obtain that way is you obtain instance with, without degree two vertices. So by the previous lemma, so we can get, we can get rid of all degree two vertices. In particular, this implies that the number of vertices of our instance now is at most twice the number of links. Perfect. You know, so this is very easy to see, easy to prove, but just to give you a quick idea, if you don't have, I mean, the average degree of a tree is about two, it's slightly below two. Right? And because the number of edges is one less than the number of vertices, and every edge will contribute to two endpoints, so increase the degree, the, the total sum of degrees by two. And uh, this means that. So degrees of vertices are either one now, or at least three, because we don't have degree two vertices, but then you can't have more vertices in this top bracket of degree three or more than you have below here, for otherwise you would suddenly have an average degree strictly above two, and that's not possible in a tree. And this is precisely 
uh, conclusion you get out of it. So it'd be very precise, actually, number of releases will be at most twice the number of releases minus one. So we are, we are now down to a tree without degree two varices. So let's just make sure I, uh, I draw an example that, that qualifies, so that would be fine. Mm -hmm. There would be such a potential instance. And so how do we solve those instances exactly? What we can do is we can use a dynamic program. So there's different ways to do it. Let me give you just one way to do it. Uh, so let's just number a set of all links in, in an arbitrary way. Let's say L1 to assume LM is the last one. And so for each of those prefixes, so whenever we do dynamic programs, what I'm, uh, we have to talk, one way to explain what it's doing is um, we talk about the table entries. So what exactly are you computing? Then we have to see you can compute those table entries in a particular order um, uh, in, uh, efficiently. Mm -hmm. So for each prefix, you will look at prefixes of those links. So prefix would be like L1 up to some, some link Li, and each subset of, of the edges of the graph, what we do is we simply say the cheapest way to cover those edges with this with the links in those in this prefix here. So it's not hard to see that you can propagate that. So it's sort of the prefix of a single link and then two links and so on. And moreover, because we have at most twice as many vertices as leaves, so the number of edges we have is at most 2K, it's a spanning tree. Then the number of options here is at most two to the power of 2K, which gives you 4K and explains that factor up here. And now it's, it suffices to observe that the propagation step can be done efficiently in the input size. So I'll not go through those details, but it's just should give you the idea of how it can be done. I'm happy to explain more if I have more details, or else, of course, you can see it and uh, also check it in the reference. But I normally try to at least give the, um, so it's always a bit of, a, of maybe a little bit of a pain to give all the details of a dynamic program, and especially when I want to do it formally in a formal correct way. But what I will try to do is I will try to typically to explain what the table entries are and, uh, and tell you uh, then how the program can be built up. And this should be enough information to complete things uh, and, and complete the full dynamic program. Good, that's the last special case I want to cover. Now I would like to move over to beating the factor of two for tree augmentation. So here we will, um, so let me first just introduce another uh, completion concept that's useful in, in it's actually a weaker version of the metric completion. So, so why, so metric completion seemed nice, right? It seemed nice because um, uh, I was able to reduce an arbitrary instance to one without degree two varices. Um, however, one issue with that completion is that if you start with an unweighted instance and you use the metric completion, you will end up with a weighted instance. So um, if you want to exploit that, you start an unweighted one and probably don't want to apply the metric completion up front. You can apply, we can apply it later on for particular sub problems we, we will face, but, uh, but we don't want to apply it up front. And this is the weaker version or one weaker version is to use the so-called shadow completion. So let's first agree on what a shadow is. I explained a little bit and briefly before I'm done an example. So a shadow of a link is simply any other link that whose path is a sub path of the of the former link. So let me, as a picture is worth more than a thousand words. So let's assume, let's just make sure, make sure number them the same way as we have here on top. So this is L2, if a link L2. And the shadow of L2 is just another link that has the property that its path, so it, what it covers, is contained in what L2 covers. So think of a shadow as a strictly, or it's not necessarily strictly, but, but think, think of it as a weaker link. It's a link that covers less. So actually it's always better if the costs are the same, for example, if they're both cost one, let's say in, in the unweighted case, it's always at least as good to pick L2 than picking L1 because it just covers more of the edges. Hmm. 
that's called a shadow. And we will often assume, it's actually from now on, I will assume that the instance is the reveal with its shadow complete. But what it means is for any link, I will just include all of its shadows. This is, a, as I mentioned, this should not, it, this will not increase the options you have, but it makes it easier to, um, uh, uh, to require certain structural properties. And maybe re remember what I did before with the, what's in the metric completion with this case one, case two, for example, in case two, I just shorten the link. From this shortening, I could still do because the shortening just needs a shadow. And, and they can do such operations which help to, to um, uh, obtain more structured solutions. That's why this is mostly a, really for, for convenience that we use the shadow completion. There's nothing happening here. So let's assume from now on we work, that we work the shadow complete instance. And now we can start with the actual approach to beta factor two. And so, so I'm in the comfortable situation that can now give a, um, an exposition in hindsight. So there's been a lot of things happening in that area and uh, some really nice ideas, in my opinion, starting here with, I uh, will start with the work of David Achashvili, um, who has the, a beautiful decomposition idea that's, that's quite simple actually, but uh, nevertheless quite powerful. And this has later been improved as one component of it that has been improved by uh, Fiorini, Gross, uh, Grenemann, and Sanita. And I will then immediately also include that improvement later on. Um, and also there's one, uh, the whole decomposition procedure can be done a bit more, um, uh, can be done in a black box way. And that's the result of, uh, of uh, the co-authors of mine, Fabrizio Grandoni and Christopher Kalaitis and myself, um, that, um, uh, uh, that also helps to, to make things a bit cleaner. And, and so I will try to immediately present things now in hindsight using all those ingredients, uh, presenting what I believe is maybe one of the, of the currently uh, cleanest ways to look at this uh, approach in general. So it's a mix of different results. I will try to be explicit where, um, uh, in which paper you can find which one of those techniques. So the first one is the decomposition techniques, which is due to David Achashvili level. We'll show a little, um, slightly modified version of it, but it's really that technique. Um, so what's the idea? The idea is you're given a tab instance, again, it's unweighted, and you would like to break it into smaller parts. Um, so it's actually an LP-based procedure. So let's assume you start with a point in with a solution to the cut LP. For example, an optimal cut LP solution. You will later have to change this a little bit. You need some somewhat stronger constraints, but for the time being, that's all we need for the decomposition procedure. You just need to have that property. And so assume you're in the following situation. There's an edge E. So just look at any edge. And so there's like the instance continues in both sides of that edge. Let me denote the vertices here on the right hand side as by, by V of, or let me maybe just name first the vertices here. So this is U, this is V. And let's denote this is VB, the vertices in V and the vertices on the U side. So I just partitioned the whole vertex set into the one on the U side and the one on the B side. So now assume that, so let's look at the links that cover the edge E. Let me just give you a few examples. So one may be a link like that, it's L1. One may start maybe at U and go over here. Let's call this L2 and this is another one, an L3. This captures all kind of types of links that you can have that cover that actually could also be one that goes directly from U to V. They also be an option. Let me, let me skip that one just for, uh, for a sake of simplicity. So what we would like to do is in, in some circumstances, we would like to, to split the instance at E and create two separate instances. So first, what does it mean in some, under some circumstances? So what I would like to have here is you would like that if you look at the coverage, so some of the Y values on, so cuff of E are really the links that cover these, those are blue links on top. Let's sum up the Y values. And what you would like to have, I would like that this is small. If a few links that go over E, then somehow there's a little happening that connects the left-hand side of your instance to the right-hand side, at least in terms of the current LP solution that you have. So if this is small, let's say with respect to both, So what should it be small uh, with respect to what should it be small? It should be small with respect to the leaves in both, on both sides. It's a number of leaves in the U. 
and the number of leaves in VB. In that case, I would like to split the instance. And that's what David Atchashvili did. Split the instance again. I'll explain to you now what I mean by splitting the instance. Maybe just before explaining that, let me just be clear. Um, maybe what, let's try to quantify this. So here, what will be fine is whenever, what I need is that the, the Y value on links covering that edge should be no more than an epsilon fraction of the number of leaves in each of those subtrees. So sometimes I will be, I'll be not too explicit about the constants. Actually, often I will be not too explicit about constants um, that I'm using. So I may, uh, I may just drop some constants in front of, of such inequalities. Um, what I will just do is I'll just use big O notation. So maybe if you really want to get an epsilon error at the end, then you may have to choose maybe here epsilon over two or epsilon over three. But, but uh, I want to make sure you get the order of magnitude of those uh, main inequalities. Good. So if so I would like that this is a few links here compared to number of leaves. If this happens, if that's the case, then we split. So again, what does splitting mean? Splitting means that you can create two independent sub instances actually with independent cut LP solutions. One containing only, looking only at the left-hand side, let me include the edge E in the left-hand side problem, but I could do it just as well including the other one or even in both, but let me just uh, uh, do it this way to fix one particular way to realize it. Um, so think of this as the original versus U and V, it's a pre-vertex U, uh, V that we have here. And we simply, the links that have already been in the, in the original instance, completely contained on one side, so both endpoints in VU, I just, I just take them, also use them over here as the same links with the same LP value. Only for the links that cross, that are covered yet, she, we have to uh, discuss what we're gonna do with those. And we'll simply use them on both problems, at least, uh, so let's just check it. So L1, for example, I will just shorten it. So I'll use a shadow that just goes up to V. And L3 is already one such link. Let's just keep it the way it is. It's nothing to do here. And L2 is now a link that goes from U to V. So just use the shadows of those links by, by shortening the right end point down to the vertex V. On the other side, we would have L2. Here, shorten as well. So this L2 has to be shortened on the, the left-hand side vertex will be shortened from U to V. So PL2 and uh, also L1 will be shortened. And I don't need L3. So here L3, I can drop it. It doesn't cover anything in that subtree. So let's just not use it. So what exactly they obtain? So, they, so let's just first agree or be clear uh, once more what I what we actually did. So splitting on an edge means that we split at one of this, its two endpoints into two sub instances. The, we keep all the links that had both endpoints on one of those two sides. They just, we just take them over to our new split instance. And the links that go over E, they may have to be split into two parts, left hand side and right hand side. And we just keep, we copy the LP values. So what do we obtain? We obtain now LP solutions for two independent sub problems. So we obtain two independent problems, but also we obtain cut LP solutions together with those problems. And um, what happened to the LP value? So we started doubling links. So now here L1 and L2, they exist twice. So actually the LP values we had on those got doubled. If you just look at the total LP value altogether. So the LP value actually increased. But increased by at the most, by, by very little, at most an O epsilon, uh, let's say a, a total factor of one plus O epsilon. Let me just explain that briefly. So the reason is that, why is that true? So we know that the, the links crossing, the links covering E, they are at most an epsilon fraction of the leaves on, on the two sides. So what you can observe is that the cut LP value of any instance 
is actually at least as large as the number of leaves you have divided by two. So, so why is that true? That's true because whenever you have a leaf, let's say it's a leaf here, let's say it's the word with the single edge because they're going out of the leaf and then the tree continues on this side. I mean, there must be a total load of links, I mean, links with a total LP value of at least one that cover that, that leaf edge E. I mean, all those links, they must have one endpoint here. It's the only way to cover that edge, right? So this means that the, the, the LP degree at every leaf vertex is at least one. Therefore, the total LP degree on the leaf vertices is at least number of leaves. And because any, every link can contribute to at most two leaves, I have to divide by two. It's just a general statement also about, it could, I mean, I didn't know that the reasoning with respect to the cut LP, but it's also true just in, in general for optimal solutions, which of course follows by the cut LP being a relaxation, but let's just do it uh, from scratch. So if I give you any instance, if it has a hundred leaves, we need at least 50 links, right? Because each leaf vertex needs to be incident to at least one link. And that's just the LP reasoning of the LP variant of the reasoning. Good. And so now you see, but the number of links is large, right? Because what we covered, the, the coverage of the, the Y value on the, on the links covering E is only an epsilon fraction of the link of the leaves. So therefore, the, um, if you double this LP value, this will be a small fraction of the total LP cost. So this was nice for splitting once, but of course, we're going to split them multiple times. But I hope at least that, that this helps to um, uh, understand the general splitting idea. And I will, I will get back to that splitting. Uh, or be more precise now how we apply this repeatedly. But at least now you should see, uh, understand what I mean when I say, oh, I will split at an edge. That's what, I would, uh, what I'm gonna do. That's what I'm gonna do here. So when you wanna, so now it would be ideal if you could split um, very often, of course. If you could split often. And uh, so we would like to often have, have a lot of edges with a very small Y load. And ideally there's a lot of leaves on ideally in both sides, but at least in one side, actually. Uh, so let's just first look at the, um, at the first property I'd like to have. So I, uh, so I would like to have that there's only edges with a small Y load, because this means, it, so small Y load means the Y of coverage of E should be small, because this is maybe a first condition that is good to have if you wanna, if you wanna split at that edge. And it turns out you can get that essentially for free. That's another observation that uh, in, uh, in Atsushvili's paper, this, uh, I think it's beautiful and um, uh, simple, but, but beautiful. So let's just look at, uh, let's look at your LP solution Y, your cut LP solution. And let's look at those edges where there's a high load on them. So it's, it's a definition. Let's look at all the edges in E, so in the original instance, we didn't do any splitting so far. And look at those that have, that are heavily covered. So heavily covered means to me, at least the coverage of one over epsilon. So they may be, so this may be your, your original, in, original tab instance, <clears throat> sorry. So they may be anywhere in that tree. Some may be connected of those heavily covered ones. Some may be, uh, there may be different connected components of heavily covered edges. Um, maybe this is the edge set of heavily covered edges and all the other ones are lightly covered. So what we're gonna do now is we've actually first just covered those it, it turns out we can cover them very cheaply. And once they're, so we, so we, we will define a link set that covers those. We will fix that link set and this will reduce the instance. We can just contract everything we covered already. And this will contract all of the red edges away. And then it will continue the remaining instance. So we would like to cover H, but covering H, if I just ask you to cover just the edges H, the subset of the original edges. That's again a tab instance, by the way, right? So you could, um, so it's a, it's a tab instance. It's the instance you obtain by looking at that tree and just contracting all of the black edges. Then you have an instance where you only can cover red edges. And what is nice is a tab instance with a, with a cut LP solution. So with cut LP solution. Namely, you can use epsilon times y as a cut LP solution. That will be a cut LP solution because every each one of those edges has a has a coverage. If we just use y, it's covered a 
by at least one over epsilon, if I use epsilon times y, it's still covered at least by one mean. Oh, very good. We got a question. So what is what is epsilon? And um, so it turns out what I will do here is so we will um, what is my my main maybe I should I should uh, I should explain it that way. So I would like to reduce general instances through a just realistic composition approach. We want to reduce them to um, uh, to much better structured instances. They will be so called they will be so called k wide instances. But actually, this reduction will have will incur an extra cost, and this cost, uh, how much it will cost, this will be um, uh, parameterized by epsilon. So I hope that we can go. What we're going to do is we're going to do a reduction such that you will lose uh, one plus epsilon factor in the approximation guarantee. Yeah. So think of epsilon as an, as an error in the reduction we now perform. So this is a good point. Thanks for that question. I probably I should have set that up from you. You see that that link. Very good. So covering H, so to tap instance with cut LP solution, epsilon times Y. But now I just recall that we, we showed that the uh, cut LP has an integral to gap of at most two. That was this, uh, this idea of splitting every link into two uplinks. This will double the LP value, but then we obtained an instance whose constraint matrix is, so a cut LP whose constraint matrix is totally a modeler and can be solved integrally. So let me just, Write this down here. So we know that the integral to gap of the cut LP is at most two. So this means that you can cover all the edges in H with at most twice times e times epsilon times let's just write the one norm just the value of the of the, the output solution y the most dead many links and so keep in mind so y is so this is the lp value of the cut lp solution so that is if it's an optimal cut lp solution it's a lower bound to the optimal value so you pay only an o epsilon of opt so this is an o epsilon of opt. So this means that you can assume there's no heavily covered edge um, essentially for free by using an epsilon factor. So now let's put things together. And so I hope this will help to, to clarify how this, um, you know, different components are uh, interact with each other. So what we now do is, uh, so it's just David to David to me this uh, decomposition approach. So starting with a cut LP point, we first cover all the heavy edges by using this procedure over here. This gives us a link set that's only at most an epsilon cost of epsilon fraction of opt at most. So we just include all those links. We can remove all the edges and more precisely contract the edges we just covered and we'll be left with a residual tab instance and, and also the, the original solution we had, the original point Y, which will cut out P solution, will still be a, a cut out P solution for this residual problem. So long story short, with that approach, we can just assume that whenever you have a cut out P solution, that no edge is heavily covered. So let's assume that we already did that. So what you see here is the graph after removing the heavily covered edges. After it's done, we want to use the decomposition approach. And so the way I would like to apply it, so it's a bit different the way it's explained in, in a church field's paper, but it's really the same idea, is just fix an arbitrary root. And now what I would like to do is I will try to find an edge on which I can, I can split. Maybe this is one that I can split off that part. And what does it mean where I can split? So the property I want to have is not that I have a lot of leaves on both sides. Actually, I use a slightly weaker property. I just want that on the non-root side of the edge where I want to split. So it's the edge D now where I would like to split. I want that the number of leaves you have in here is at least one over epsilon squared. Let me just explain why, why I want to have, why I want to do it that way. So rem remember, we will double the LP value of, so when we do that, we double certain links, namely the links that cover E. But those links have a total value of at the most one over epsilon because we covered all heavily covered edges. 
And therefore, the value that the, the number of leaves you have here is by a factor of one over epsilon larger than that. So this means that whatever the LP values in here is, is a lot larger than what you have to double to, um, uh, to split the instance. So it, it amortizes the splitting. So just amortize from outside to inside. So that blob here amortizes the cost of splitting here. And then we continue. So an evil always should be chosen to be an outermost edge. So maybe there's another one here we can split off. Maybe after splitting that one off, maybe we can also split this one here to split at, at this edge, right? And so on and so forth. Let me do a few more. Um, let's, um, let's pick that one. Maybe, maybe we can also split on this one. So let's assume that the decomposition procedure ends here. Um, yeah, I don't I make no claims that this makes uh, any sense in terms of the precise number of leaves in each of the, of the subtrees, but you, I hope you got the idea. So now it turns out we've now a, a, a bunch of independent subproblems. So one is just the one over here we split off. One is, let me give you another one. Another one is, is for example, this subproblem here. That we obtained after we split off that part, and then we split off this blue part. That's also an, an, an subproblem in itself. And all of those subproblems have one common property that you want to explore. It. Rico, can I interrupt? Quick question. Sure. Yes, sure. Uh, yes. So when you when you when you do the splitting, you're not resolving the LP, right? So you fix the LP solution, and then you repeatedly see the, whether this condition holds, and so then. You take it out. You don't uh, resolve the LP after taking it out. Exactly. Exactly. Yes, Carter. So, so we don't resolve the LP. So for a time being, you'll see there will be um, some issues appearing, and, and they're precisely linked to that. But, but for a time being, let's let's not resolve it. If I don't resolve it, we we should at least have the guarantees that so the whole splitting. So I get now a couple of independent problems, and the LP. I still have an, a cut LP solution for the whole thing, and this one is not much more uh, expensive than the original one because I can always amortize against what I split off. So the cost for doubling here, amortize against this one, this block, the cost I have for splitting at this edge here will be amortized against that one. The cost for splitting here will be amortized against the leaves in blue. And so the amortization is always, it's not, nothing gets, gets used twice in the amortization, but, but you're right, Kartik. So we will actually, uh, we will keep that one LP solution from the beginning. We will not resolve it for a time being. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you, perfect. So that's a splitting we, we will do. And so now let's look at, at one of those sub problems. Let me just, for convenience, pick the one that contains the root, but, um, uh, but it doesn't really make a, a difference whether you pick another one. Um, let's pick the one that contains the root. Let's just look at it. The, um, if you look at, at that one, then there's, um, there's three principal subtrees hanging off the root. Let's just look at them first. So there's this, oh, this part here. So up to many principal subtrees, I just look at the three neighbors of the root and look at the trees that are the subtrees corresponding those to those three neighbors that are left. So this one is this one, one is the one over here. A little bit there. Uh, yeah, I hope it can highlight this clearly enough. Um, and one is this one here. So what is key now is if you look at any of those, let's pick that one. So it turns out we did not split on this edge, but we could have split on that, right? But we didn't. So why didn't we do it? Because the only reason why we didn't do it is it didn't fulfill that criteria, the splitting off criteria. This means the number of leaves you've in here is actually no more, even strictly less than one over epsilon square. So this means those components we have now uh, so this is the remaining instance. So the remaining instance will consist of all of those red ones and the root, of course. But if you look at those principal subtrees hanging off the root, they actually, each one of them only has constantly many leaves. So they're very structured. So it turns out, so just to have a name for them, let, let's call them KY. So, it's, so what is a KY tree? A KY tree is so just a general, a general notion uh, about trees. You can, Think of them uh, outside the context of tab if you want to. So a KY tree is a tree. Um, so it's KY with respect to some root R. Um, it's KY if when you look at the principal subtrees, so again, to me, principal subtrees are, so we have to be a bit more, a little bit fuzzy about it maybe in the sense that 
beforehand, sorry, before the set, those are the, the subtrees um, of this type, but actually I will include the root. That's just again for convenience. When I talk about the principal subtree, I will, I will look at the green set that includes the root as well. So we have that each of those principal subtrees um, has at most, if each of the principal subtrees has at most k leaves, I call the instance k1. And what we discussed so far is that with the decomposition approach, this is a somewhat fuzzy statement, but I will be more clear about it in a moment. Um, we actually obtained O1 over epsilon square white tab instances. But here comes now a big, um, uh, one big issue to, to keep in mind. Um, so this is not the black box reduction in a sense. Of course, now you could say, let's just solve those somehow separately. And if you can do this really well, we probably get a good solution for the original problem, uh, but that's wrong. That's wrong because maybe through the splitting, so, so the splitting procedure just guarantees that you have now cut LP solutions in each one of those instances that are cheap, all, all, all of them together are cheap. However, it could be that maybe in one of the splitting steps, we split at an edge that where our LP used few links, maybe total link load of, let's say, uh, 11.2, for example, right? And, uh, but maybe the optimal solutions or the, the, the single optimal solution potentially may use a lot of links that cover that edge. So in that case, our splitting uh, will have increased the, um, uh, so if you think about opt, so the value of opt, if you split opt, will increase by a lot. So this means if you want to get a guarantee with respect to the original problem, so one option would be that you now find a procedure for k-wide instances that is good with respect to the LP value of the cut LP. If you get that, then you, then you can make a, you can, you can chain together things and get, get a guarantee for the whole thing together because you know that for each of those instances, you would get a solution or, or here for each of those instances here, you will get a solution that is good with respect to the local LP value. And you know that some of those LP values is good with respect to the original LP value. But for time being that, so if, if you don't obtain an LP based procedure, um, for time being, it's unclear. Uh, so this decomposition approach will not uh, immediately lead to a good solution to the original problem, even if you can, could solve the k by problems you obtain optimally. So that's good to keep in mind. Uh, but before we will fix that, but before we fix that, let's still think a little bit about those constant wide instances and see how we can solve them. And here, so this is a, it's actually one way to do it, and this also goes back to David Achishvili, is to use two different approaches. And then one of those approaches got improved by this paper by Ferrini, Gross, Kernemann, and Sanita. So it's a very nice procedure I explained last time. And I will, I will uh, recall it uh, again here. Let me start with the first approach. So the first approach, So assume it's a k-wide instance. So the principal subtrees have only a few links. And here what you see is um, this could be a potential solution when you put a value of a half on each of those links. I, I color them in two colors. In red, you see the, the so-called cross links, the ones going between different principal subtrees. And in green, you see the, the so-called inlinks. We talked about that last time. Inlinks are those that have both endpoints within the same principal subtree. So there can be uplinks like this one here, or there may be links like this one that is not an uplink, but still is contained in the same principal subtree. And this one here. So what's the first approach? First, we could, what, what we could do is, now what I tried to do is I get back to what I mentioned uh, last time when I talked about special cases, I started to talk about special cases. I said, oh, there are beautiful building blocks you can use later on to design. Uh, approximation algorithms. And that's what we're going to do now. So actually now transform those instances into, into one of those cases we've seen before that we can solve efficiently. The transformation will be lossy, but we can control the loss. So the first one is just split the crosslinks. Into the most two uplinks. So let me be clear about that. What do I mean with Splitting them, it's the same splitting procedure we already used previously. If you look at this crosslink here, for example, so we'll remove it and replace it by two uplinks. In this case, uplinks means because they're crosslinks, their apex is the root, so the uplinks will go from the endpoints up to the root. But so sort of, I'm going to do that for each one of the crosslinks. So let's just think for a time being about how to solve k instances. Let's even let's not even think too much about the cut LP. 
Let's just look at the instance. I, I just replace every crosslinks, every crosslink by two uplinks. And now I obtain a new instance, which has a nice property, namely each of the principal subtrees is independent. There's no link left that connects two different principal subtrees. So essentially, the problem now boils down in this particular example, um, it will breaks down into four independent tree implementation problems, each in one for each principal subtree. But keep in mind, the principal subtrees only have constantly many leaves. So now I can solve them optimally because we can solve instances with constantly many leaves optimally. That's what we talked about at the very beginning during this lecture. So let's solve the resulting, the resulting instances optimally. Maybe let's talk about what, what do we obtain? What is the, the, the cardinality of the obtained solution? Let's get a bound for it. I'm just, let's get a bound for that. So if you do that, just think about opt. And let me move this a bit to the left. So if you take an optimal solution, you could just take each of its crosslinks and just replace it by the two uplinks. Right? And then you get a solution of this type, a solution using links of the type I obtain after doing the splitting step. This means if I can get the best of those solutions, which, which I can, um, this will be no more expensive than doing precisely that, taking opt, looking at the number of crosslinks in opt times two, because they maybe have to be, each one of them has to be replaced by two links, plus the number of in links of opt. So this solution here has at least, there's no more than that many links. And what is crucial is you see we lose a factor of two, but only on the crosslinks. So that procedure is a strong procedure if you have few crosslinks. It's a weak procedure if the majority of the weight lies on the crosslinks, or the majority of the, of the, the uplinks are, are actually crosslinks. That's why we have the second approach. So here we try to lose on the inlinks only, namely we again split links, but we, this time we split all the inlinks. Into the most two uplinks. So same thing as before, but inlinks instead of crosslinks. So let's just do the example. So let's take this inlink here. This is not an uplink yet. We will remove it and replace it by two uplinks again from the endpoints to the apex of the link. So by doing that, we obtain an instance with only crosslinks and uplinks. And that's where this procedure by Fiorini, Gross, Kahneman, and Sanita comes into play, which uh, says that we can solve those instances optimally. So what's the guarantee? So again, you can think of pop if you take the opt links and just replace the in links there by two uplinks, then you get a solution and we get the best one. So ours will be at least as good as that one. So our solution will have a number of links, which is no more than the number of crosslinks in opt plus twice the number of in links in opt. Perfect. So now by, uh, I just got a question. Let me, let me first um, uh, answer that question. The question is, um, so can you please repeat why in, all, in approach one, the resulting instance can be solved optimally? Yeah, good point. So in approach one, we split the crosslinks into two uplinks. So take the original, so assume we're given a k-wide instance, so it replaces a constant. And just first, before you do anything, just replace each crosslink you could potentially take in, in your solution by two uplinks. So those uplinks will go to the root because the crosslink is defined as one that goes between principal subtrees. So its apex will be at the root. But now when you look at this instance, then any link in your new instance now will only, that the path of the link, the path of what it covers is fully contained in only one of the principal subtrees. Right? There's no link, no crosslink left. There's no link left that, that will actually touch more than one principal subtree. 
But this means that, so the problem, the tap, problem solving tap means covering all of the edges of your tree. But this means this problem now breaks down into independent problems, one for each principal subtree. Right? So we can now solve each principal subtree independently. But, in, but a single principal subtree only has constantly many leaves. And now I can apply this fixed parameter tractable uh, with this FPT result that I can actually solve instances with constantly many leaves, actually even with low vertically many, I can solve those optimally. So I'll just optimally solve each of those, of those um, uh, principal subtrees and take the solution. All solutions together will be a solution to the original problem. Just as a um, uh, result to the question, I hope uh, it makes kind of sense. Otherwise, please let me know. I'm happy to get into more details. So it breaks the problem into independent ones, one for each principal subtree, and then we can exploit the property that the instance is constant y. Perfect. So, so now if you just return the better of the two solutions, when you get at least a solution that's at least as good as the average of these two guarantees, or when you get the minimum of the two, it's certainly at least as good as the average. So returning, maybe should write a sentence about it. So returning. The better of these two solutions. It leads to um, uh, so we get a solution. A solution with at most the minimum of the two number of links. So one solution gives me that guarantee. The other one gives me the guarantee with the two on the other term in front of the other term. So there will be L cross plus twice opt L in. And now this is certainly no more than the average of these two. And the average of the two is precisely three halves of opt. So this gives you a three half approximation for K by the instances. So now, you have to put things together. So I gave you a decomposition approach that that um, um, that somehow seems to lead to O one wide instances, and we have now a procedure that is a three half approximation for O wide instances. We have to make sure they're compatible. Actually, there's also a large part of of both the paper of uh, of Achishvili and the one in in Fiorini, Gross, Kerneman, and Sanita is actually showing that this can be a uh, that those are compatible. Those two steps. Um, it turns out that one can do this in a black box way. I will show this later. But let me just first talk about how people did it uh, at the beginning when they when they came up with those approaches. So one option is to do the following. One option is to take the original LP and you just make it stronger. So you don't take the cut LP, but you include all constraints you need such that after doing the whole decomposition approach, let me just scroll back, you will end up with those k-bot instances that there you still have the constraints you need to do these two approaches. So one for down here, we need this, the, the so-called Schwartal-Gomori cuts to be able to, uh, to do that rounding. For the one up here, you need a constraint that says, oh, for each sub-instance with at most uh, constantly many leaves, most k leaves, you want to have um, the, the number of links you use to cover that should be at least as high as the optimal number because you can solve them optimally. So the constraints of that type. It's a bit annoying to include them at the beginning because you have to make sure that after the composition approach that they still look the way you want them to look like to be able to apply those rounding approaches here, but it can be done. And, uh, and uh, that's already done in, in, in the Shreelis paper and also in the, in the one by Fiorini, Gross, Kerneman, and Sanita, they show that, that this can actually be achieved, um, uh, that this is compatible. But it takes quite some time to um, actually to, to prove that. So now what I would like to show you, so I don't want to go more into those details because there's a, I think a, a more elegant way to show it um, now in hindsight. And namely one can use a so-called round or cut approach. And that's really a technique I think is, is very interesting in its own. It's originally, it was originally introduced by Carr, Fleischer, Lund, and Phillips. And it's a, it's a beautiful approach. It's very general, it can be used in a variety of contexts. The idea is that you, you accept to start with a weaker LP, maybe with a, with a cut LP. Let me, let me just replace that here, maybe. Let's assume that you start at the beginning with a point in the cut LP. 
instead of an arbitrary point in zero one to the L. And then you just do as if um, that's a good point. This means you just start decomposing, you get those k-byte instances, and you try to round it. You try to apply these two rounding procedures. But when you when you do that, something may go wrong. And now let me explain it. So if, if I work, so let me explain what it means to go wrong. If they go wrong, I will actually use in the ellipsoid method. I will add a I will use the ellipsoid method, add a hyperplane, and repeat the procedure. And if they work out, I will return a tab solution. But to be more precise, let me just tell you first what it means to go wrong. I will come back to that diagram in a short moment. I will keep it here on, uh, on the screen I'm sharing. So, so what exactly is happening? So assume you have, let's just do one iteration. Assume you start with a point in the cutout beam. So we do the decomposition and let's look at one of the subs. So we, we cover that, the heavily covered edges first, then we, um, uh, we do the splitting and we end up with a, with a constant, um, with a, with a constant white instance. Let's assume that the edges in that instance, let's just call them F. I want to give them a different name, different to E, because um, E would be the original instance. Think of this as being the original instance. And after the covering the heavily covered edges and splitting, you will end up with that one. This means those edges could be anywhere here. Maybe those edges here in F could be, could correspond to this edge, that edge, and this edge here, because maybe the, the other ones were heavily covered ones that got contracted. Right. Think of this uh, so maybe this is E1, E2, E3. They may correspond to E1, E2, and E3. But they may be spread somewhere in the instance, right? Because we, we, um, uh, we did this contractions then. Yeah. And F is really the whole thing uh, for all those edges up here. So let's simply do the following. Let's now just apply the 1.5 approximation to that instance. So um, let's call this beta. Let beta be what you obtain by applying the 1 but 5 approximation. And this works for any factor. Just use 1 but 5 because it's a factor we got beforehand used by the 1 but 5 approximation. So what we're going to do is we will check. Um, so let's look at why at our, our cutout P point, and let's just see how many links does it give. What is the total load on links that cover at least one edge of F? So L of F is all the links covering at least something in this subtree. Let's look at all the links that, that have some impact on that, on that subtree. So what could be is, it could be that that is strictly smaller than two thirds times this value beta. But that would be strange, right? Because I know that beta is a three halves approximation. So I know that this is actually no more than, so I can replace beta by three halves times the opt value in F. So this is then no more than, so opt F, I mean the optimum way to cover this blue subtree in the original instance. So if I see that the Y, the total load on links I use here, is strictly smaller than two thirds of beta, and this I can check, right? Then I know this is impossible. My LP has a uh, has a weak spot, uh, has, a, has, a, has a weakness. That's what I should say. Has a weakness because actually its its link load is strictly less than the optimal way to cover those edges. So in this case, I will not round. I will say also the rounding wouldn't be that that good potentially because maybe my rounding will. Um, uh, Will be much more expensive than the LP value. That's precisely that one issue I explained before. Uh, potentially, the rounding could be more expensive than the LP value, in which case I can't compare anymore against the LP. So I think of this as the rounding would fail. Think of this as as, um, as the rounding does not succeed. This is when when this condition happens. But in this case, I know that there is I have a constraint that I'm sure is I could add to my original LP, namely I could add the constraint. I could add the constraint that says the sum of all the link values covered, covered at least something of F should be at least two thirds of beta. But they have to be- you got, you, got the, you got the question actually. Oh, yes, oh, thank um, you. Yeah, okay. Well, just a few minutes ago, uh, I'm not sure it relates to this, but what are you using that the trees are K wide? Yes, 
So where are we using that? So we're using that, let me just scroll back to your map. Where are we using it? The tree is ky for constant k. Use it in this first approach. So when we split crosslinks into uplinks, we obtained instances that are independent on, I mean, instances, independent instances, one for each principal subtree. But now we want to solve those instances in each principal subtree optimally. But to be able to do so, I exploit that the number of leaves in here is a constant, is at most k. And therefore, I can use this approach that takes four to the k time to, um, uh, to actually solve the instance. And this approach is, is polynomial time because k is a constant. And this would not be, it would not hold without that. But it's also very, it's a very good point because um, it's a good point because it shows that um, it's actually the only point where I need that the instance is ky. So a lot of things can be done without using the ky property, but this is the, the single, the single point you actually need that. Yeah, thanks for that question. I'm sorry I didn't see you earlier. Yeah. Rico, one more question. So again, this is going back to something you mentioned earlier. Uh, you mentioned this observation that uh, the decomposition allows you to reduce to constant wide instances or one over epsilon squared wide instances, but you only looked at the root side. What, what happens to those other ones that you split? Good point. So it turns out for the other ones, you can apply the same, uh, the same. So reason. you do this recursively? And um, actually, you don't even have to do it recursively. By always splitting off first outermost parts in the tree, you can also see that, for example, let's, let's, let's look at the blue one. Maybe the blue part is a good one just to give another example. So here, um, you can look at this vertex here. I think of this as being the, um, uh, like the, the local root of, uh, of that tree. So let's call it maybe, uh, let's call it R, R bar maybe. So here again, I, I did not split off that part. I could have split that off before I split off the, the blue one, right? Mm -hmm. But I didn't. This means the number of leaves here is also at most one over epsilon squared because I have the rule I always split off at the, at the outermost mm -hmm. edge where I can. And actually that way you can just observe that it holds for all of those instances. But it's, it's a good point, Karthik. Thanks for that. Uh, Remark, but one has to go through and prove that it holds for all of them. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, thanks for the questions. I'm most happy to get questions. It helps me to understand where I may have been a bit unclear and to fill in the gaps. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So, um, so back to this to this round or cut approach. So it turns out that when we have one of those k wide instances, constant wide instances, and want to want to round it. And um, when I solve it, so we can solve it up to a, a factor of one point five. If that, if let's say you need beta many links, if two thirds beta is strictly more than your LP value, then I have a, I found a constraint I can add to my original LP. Namely, I'm sure that you need at least two thirds of the beta uh, value to cover the address in F. Why that? Because beta is a three halves approximation, so it may be larger by a factor of three halves than not. But if I scale it down by two thirds, it will be a, a no more expensive than not, right? So this value here, maybe let me be clear about this too. That's what I wrote. This value here is actually, so I wrote here on top, is it will be no more essentially set inequality on top here that I'm using. So clearly you can't have a cheaper solution covering F than the optimal one that covers F. So what it means is now when you go back to this approach here, so the point Y, I tried to round, I realized, oh, I get this, this inequality here, I think uh, I will not round in that case, but now I have a hyperplane that I can use that cuts off the point Y. So there's some hyperplane of this type. What does it mean to cut it off? It cuts it off from the, um, uh, from the uh, actually the set of, of optimal solutions. And I will include that in my constraint family. And then go back and re-optimize the LP and keep going. And so when I do this, this I will just do using the ellipsoid method. Because the ellipsoid method guarantees to me that whenever, uh, that actually I only need, in, after polynomially many steps, um, I'm going to succeed. I need most polynomially many iterations of the ellipsoid method to, um, uh, uh, to get uh, an actual feasible point. And therefore, after polynomially many steps, you will be here and the rounding procedure succeeds. So for all of the trees, we left in equality the other way around. But it's a, I think it's a beautiful concept. Uh, maybe it needs a bit of, uh, if it's the first time you see it, probably you need to think about it uh, maybe a bit more. Um, but it's, it's beautiful because it's extremely general. Um, and now it's a black box reduction, we obtain. So what it means is you put everything together. So I'm 
Uh, oh, wait, we have one more question. Let me let just finish that sentence and I get back to your question. So it means that this leads to the, the following reduction, namely, if you have any alpha approximation that works for KY cap, then you will actually get an approximation for general cap that is an alpha approximation plus a small error, and the error vanishes uh, when k goes to infinity. So if you can solve constant wide instances, in other words, if you want to solve cap or want to approximate cap actually, then all you need to do is to consider constant wide instances. If you can do that, if you get any approximation factor for that, you will get almost the same factor of an arbitrarily small error for a general instance, for a general case. Let me get to the question. So just read it out. So in the, in the round or cut part, um, how do you get the value beta before you can actually round the fractional solution y? So does that mean that the one to five approximation algorithm uh, does not need y to be actually uh, feasible? Yeah, so exactly. So actually what we're doing is, um, good point. So what is beta? So we use, we use first the point y to do the whole decomposition to cover the heavy edges decomposed. Then once we get the ky, the constant wide instances, we forget about the LP solution. You can forget about it. We just use the procedure we had discussed before. I'll just scroll back. This procedure here, just these two procedures to solve, to get a 1.5 approximation for that KY instance. And then we compare it against the LP. If it's, oh, let me scroll, sorry for the scrolling. If the LP is significantly cheaper, it's cheaper than two thirds of the solution we obtain, then we will not we will not return that solution, but strengthen the LP. Otherwise, we, am, uh, we, will, we will keep the solution. So if, if this holds for, if we have the other inequalities, the larger equal to thirds beta for each of those subproblems, I will just return those solutions because I can compare them against the LP. And I know the LP is a relaxation of the actual problem. So the LP is no more expensive than an optimal solution. But so finally, the actual procedure you need here for constant wide instances is not even looking at uh, it's not even looking at the LP solution. It's just we just look at it after after we obtain beta after we obtain the one to five approximation to see whether it compares against the LP. And this is also the reason why it makes it so much more uh, the it makes it so much more independent. The decomposition is much more independent from the actual procedure for constant wide instances, and and we don't need any any connection between the two. Yeah, thanks for that question. Yeah, so it's also it's a change in how people, uh, yeah, it's a bit, it's one change how people thought about it. For example, if you look at the paper of uh, Farini et al., I mean, they, they write that their procedure has three main properties, and one of them is, is it's compatible with uh, a Chashvili's decomposition approach. And this black box reduction shows it's actually, this point is irrelevant because everything will be compatible if you do a black box reduction. Mm -hmm. uh, perfect. And thanks for the question. So finally, for the charging argument, you, you you finally end up showing that the LP is at least some, it's not too small relative to the optimum. Exactly. So the LP will always be a relaxation, but it could be that at the beginning it's too small. And, and if I, this is when I get constraints of this type, I mean, I get inequalities of this type. And then it's just strengthen it to guarantee, as you just said, that the LP I have at the end is not too small with respect to all. Exactly. Re recap. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, just to clarify, because uh, ellipsoid is near and dear to me, you you need like a fancy version of ellipsoid here, mm -hmm. right? Which like, I mean, in the sense that for it to to, to terminate, um, I think you need to like reduce dimension at some point mm -hmm. uh, if you keep cutting. Um, and uh, yeah, I was just curious if. Uh, if I'm not missing anything, and uh, if people like know that, <laughs> yeah, indeed. What is to, what is to watch out what version we, we use? I mean, to be very precise, I think one um, also one question is whether I mean, I talked here a bit about um, ellipsoid as if it were the feasibility version, right? That's also one. I mean, first of all, it's feasibility optimization. I mean, this is one way to get around that point, but it's just one aspect. It's not quite as we fully cover all the technical details, but one is you could also guess. The, um, uh, the optimal value of the of your tab instance. I mean, it's an unweighted one. There's just probably many many options, and then you could just enforce that you only look at the um, uh, at points that have that value. So then it indeed becomes a feasibility problem. That's already a good thing, and uh, then you can actually use a feasibility version of it. But you also have to observe that constraints I'm adding. Those constraints have have actually constant coefficients. 
the actual F zero one coefficients. I and this is also important that we're unable to indeed do the, the various steps in the Lipset method. But apart from that, you can use a um, uh, essentially just from a, a textbook version, for example, by from uh, some virtual transcriber to um, have to do it. Uh, uh, yeah, no, but still, how do you know that you terminate if you don't do if you do the textbook version? I think you can exactly you can imagine. So what you can imagine is imagine an LP that contains all of those potential constraints you could add, right? So it's a bit it's a bit fuzzy because I mean of course it depends on what precisely the beta will be that the new procedure will return. Um, I mean the, those are uh, I mean those are deterministic procedures, so we could even compute them up front. And if one big LP that it, it does exist, and I would like to optimize over that one. So think of applying ellipsis for that big LP, right? Um, I don't really do it because I don't, I mean, I don't see that LP, but, uh, and actually I may also terminate without having upon the LP. But if you now think about that LP, then it's really just, I think, a standard ellipsis version. I mean, that one together with the constraint that the optimal value, that, that the value is, is good enough, because this is an LP with small coefficients. And, uh, and the thing you can, um, also you can, let's see, for to go to lower dimension, I think this should be quite uh, standard. Um, yeah, I don't think that there's any any additional difficulties that should show up then. If you think of it that way, I mean, what can happen, of course, is that I mean, my Lipset method. So it could be that I'm that the point I obtain at some at some moment is still not in that LP in this magic LP, but maybe the rounding algorithm already works. Right, this could happen. Of course, I don't care about that. As soon as the rounding algorithm works. It's, it's good enough because I have the guarantee coming from the comparison to the current LP. So this can happen. But I think for the running time, for normal running time, you could compare against that LP. Yeah, yeah no, no, that's true. I mean, but the, the, the uh, even, even for solving feasibility in the, in the sort of more in this like Oracle model, you need some like Diophantine approximation or at least virtual of us from Shriver needs some Diophantine approximation to to get you an exact solution, like to reduce sort of you, you reduce dimension of the problem iteratively. Um, anyway, it's a technical point. I was just curious about. I agree, you need to get that. Yeah. But I think that should, that should work out because of the small coefficients. But I'm, I'm happy to talk about it more, but you're right, of course, this has to be, um, uh, has to be possible, yeah. Good point, yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah. Um, so I'm soon running out of time. Let me just um, uh, wrap up then. Um, so, so we get this black box reduction. Now putting everything together, you get a one to five approximation, a one to five plus epsilon approximation for tap. And the epsilon comes now from this reduction. Right? There's one more thing I want to mention very briefly, but I don't want to go into any details because I don't have enough time for that now. So it turns out you can actually even improve on that one. So what's kind of interesting, as I said, I, I give a kind of hindsight perspective on what happened. I mean, people working on those problems, I mean, this one to five with a very similar approach without the black box reduction was, uh, was first shown by Farini, Gross, Kerneman, and Sunny Tap. But, the, but they, as well as uh, David Achishvili, I mean, they mostly uh, sold the result through the, um, um, because this even extends to the case where you have the right, where you have a weighted setting with bounded weights. So the weights go from one to some constant. Um, and actually, uh, of Zayev showed you can even go from one to some logarithmic number. Uh, because the one that five approximation was, uh, was known already by Kortzhatz and Newtoff. But um, uh, when it turns out that the whole procedure can actually be further improved, and then this leads to the currently best approximation factor of 1.393. And the weight can be improved is by improving this first approach I explained, where you, where you solve the, the principal subtrees independently. What you can do is you can actually observe that when you solve them independently, then what we did is we split the crosslinks into two uplinks and, and then sampled and then, and then solved uh, those instances. But now you can observe that when you pick crosslinks, that they indeed also cover some part in another principal subtree. And there's a, a concept called a, a way then to, uh, in hindsight, try to improve those, uh, exploit that, and further improve the solution. It's called rewiring. It's introduced in that paper here. And you found a better analysis of it uh, later on. And by doing that, you actually get a, a factor of 1393. And what's interesting is the same technique here uh, extends. It's non-trivial extension, but it also extends to, to CAP. The connectivity augmentation problem. So the same statement holds if I write CAP here. So I don't have time to go into those details. But I just wanted to mention those results in case you're interested in going uh, and checking further um, uh, further literature on the topic. Okay, thanks a lot for your attention, and uh, I'm happy to answer more questions in case there's any 
any other, in case you have any questions about it. Thank you. 